Um, and so what I'm focused on is to get the infrared excess uh, from the container, infrared excess method. So the search for infrared excess in such a stars are kind of in. So what do we do? So we get, uh, say, the 36 objects we want to observe. So we go to the observatories and we get the EVI, natural DJ images um, for these objects in pristine weather conditions. And I insist on pristine because that we want excellent interaction because the infrared access we try to detect is really tiny. And so this is why the plot project is so bloody hard because we need um, very good weather conditions and very good data. So from this we get the observed BBI EJ. Um, then from the literature we get the temperature and logic of our tides and we deduce uh, the fairly the medical symbols like colors. B minus B and B minus I from synthetic spectra, we use the Tubingen, Tin, Code, Tin, SSA, and Tin Lab. And so by comparing these two numbers, the observer and theoretical, we get the B minus B of the reddening, using the CCN law, regular 3.1, and uh, using the observed B minus I color, assuming the companion is not contaminated in the B band, we get the red B minus I and the infrared excess, if there is one. And if there is an excess, we interpolate the companion absolute magnitude from the cool uh, star grid and reduces spectral time. So this is how we do it. Um, so also last, carried out a study uh, published just, uh, last year about this, which is a nice example of 27 objects. Um, and so I've been studying another um, sample, adding the other objects to these. So um, this is an example of the precision checks we make and to ensure good photometry. Um, this is the different objects that have been observed by both, both by Osla and I. Different runs, uh, same telescope, different cameras, different photometry procedures even. And uh, that's the main difference here. So we get a, an agreement in the, for these objects that is uh, at about 2%. So I think we can say that this is uh, good photometry. So once we rely on these numbers, then we can get the infrared excess out of it. Um, so this is what I got from my analysis. So for the 11 new objects, we get this. The, this is the temperature here, and we get the V minus I color here. The continuous line is the bottom line. So all this and all the points are the observations. So I guess so all these guys here are boring, they're, they're working fine. And all these guys here are too cruel, uh, so they show infrared excess. So I put the list here of what they are. We got EGB9, that's Munich. Uh, I see that's 72, just the 13th wing star that hasn't been studied much. LTNF1, also called B Puma, it's got a G5 companion that we've been able to retrieve. AGC6781, this one is a star one sigma detection, and there's been only one observation in each hilltop, so I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm careful with this one. And it's Cap 1 and Way 234, two planetaries that go to M4 and M3 companion uh, to new detections. So this is great. Once we have this in the I band, we can look for confirmation or more in the J band. So we use ROV uh, images and uh, two mass uh cross match with our sample. So we get six objects, same as before here. And so the two detections that we get is uh, Isolate 72, this one one as previously. And when we compare the companion spectral cells that we get from uh, J band and I band, they agree uh, here within two or one spectral. So this is a, a good agreement in search. Um, then we have the idea to extend this search to SDSS because it's a good coverage in the wavelength and it's got a good photometric precision. So we look for uh, G minus Z excess and from my sample there's nine overlapping objects with, with the one I studied before. So we use these to make sure that we have a good photometric calibration because it's not very easy with uh, SDSS. And we got the red from G minus R, uh, G minus R, U minus R, U minus G wasn't working for some reason. And so I got this good agreement here, so uh, the photometric calibration is okay because the regular stars for the okay. bottom line, and we retrieve the infrared excess for SCAP1 and uh, HB6 um, that are in my sample, and we found single spectral types. So this is encouraging, there's 50 objects from the sample of fruit that comes back with LTSS. This is uh, work on the way, and it's exciting. Right, so now going back to uh, the population uh, statistics that of mine. 
So we got 12 out of 36 objects yielding 33% of uh, binary fraction in the I band, and A out of 16 being 50% in the J band. Uh, the sample size is still small, so we got big error bars just to be extremely certain that we're not underestimating the error bar between the square root of the sample size and the error bar here and here. Um, and so these fractions are the observed fractions, uh, and they're missing the thing companions. And it's okay that the JBN here is uh, larger, the JBN fraction is larger than the IBEN because J is more sensitive than I. So this is just a bias that we can correct. So let's do it and let's draw conclusions from these numbers. What do you think of the JBN information from that? One minute. One minute, no problem. So uh, we get to account for the thin companions. In our sample, we eliminated the M3 in the IBEN and M4 in the JBN. So if we use the spectral type, this companion spectral type distribution of the regular and tau for the main sequence, uh, and the best of for the one population, it's basically what we have here. So we get to have all these guys. So it makes our uh, fractions jump from 33 to 49%, and the J band from 50 to 59%. There is also, um, we get to take into account that we observe unresolved objects. So we get to exclude all the white binaries. Uh, so if you do that, you uh, keep only the ones that are within a with separation within a few hundred AU. And this is also um, the distance at which a companion uh, is too far away to interact with the pin and shape it. So we, by doing this, we keep only the interacting binaries. Uh, three more slides. So the conclusions. We can compare this binary fraction that we found with the non spherical fraction. So we found that our binary fraction is smaller than the number of non spherical PN. So some non spherical PN come from a non binary channel. Uh, some are results from uh, planet interaction and merger, what we can't see, and of course some come from single stars. Uh, and we can improve uh, the binary fraction we measured just by increasing our sample size. And to conclude what I said at the beginning, um, we can compare this number with the progenitor of main sequence population. Um, so the main sequence population, binary fraction is 50%, if you exclude the white binaries, you get 35%. And so uh, our estimate of the binary fraction is higher than the progenitor one. So within the frame of our current low number statistics, uh, our estimate of the binary fraction of CSP and our sample stars seem to indicate that binaries are indeed the preferred, but not exclusive. <coughs> Channel for the information. Um, and this is uh, the sample is still small, it's only 36 subjects. We're going to reach 100. Uh, we have data for about 30, will be done uh, during the year, and hopefully, we can use also online surveys and some uh, data to be more conclusive. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, yes, uh, Joel. Looks very encouraging. One worry, which is that I have only recently discovered that three main sequence stars through their low surface fragments, as you move from the visual to the near infrared, look cooler. So I have the same worry about uh, using the, the, the visual to extrapolate colors into the, the near infrared. You could get fooled unless your unless your model atmospheres are very very good. So can you comment on that? Uh, sorry, can you just re explain the change in the colors? So, as you look, you know, for example, B minus B might look like, uh, say, for a green sequence star, it look like a K star. And you go to B minus I, and it suddenly looks like an early M star. I realize here you're talking about much higher photospheric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're also talking about very unsettled atmospheres of a star that's just beyond its outer layers and potentially has a low surface gravity as well, lower than expected surface. Okay, well, uh, most of our stars have a uh, magnitude of uh, a gravity of log g equals 7, and this is pretty much verified for all our targets. And uh, at these temperatures and gravities, anyway, there's a little change in the color basis, like it varies from only a few percent, uh, about like 17,000 kilometers. So our main source of error is mostly in magnitudes, and that uh, really models uh, themselves. The question in the back, do you um Yeah, so I was just going to comment a little bit on, on that. So 
I guess Carl might like comment tomorrow, but whenever we've got good radial velocity curves and good photometry for these things, you see that the, the spectral type you determine from the mass, the radius, and the color are all completely different because these things come out come out of puffed up. So the, the the spectral type that you determine from your from your colours is going to be your best estimate anyway. But it's still really worthwhile because we we have no idea. There's no there's a, there's only two or three of these things that are eclipsing that we've actually got good good handles on, on these parameters. So it's really worthwhile even if it's full up. And then the, the second thing that I really wanted to ask you about was um, how you handle the the nebula background, because again, I guess Todd might talk about this, but one of the things that we find is a massive problem when we're trying to, to do the photometry of these things is